What is this box? Well, this is the uh, Civil War sword that commemorates the Trent Affair. The Trent Affair, yes. Sent by Confederate President Jefferson Davis, James M. Mason and John Siddell were taken prisoner off the British ship, the Trent. This is not used in battle, this guy's sword right here. Okay. And neither were either of the two envoys. Oh, uh, no, 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 they were politicians. Politicians right. never fight. <laughs> <laughs> John Slidell had the sword commissioned and gave it to James Mason. They were the two Confederate envoys that were arrested by the Union. I'm asking 15,000, and if we can meet somewhere around 12 to 13, I may sell it. God, this is pretty amazing. Okay. To James Mason, lest, lest we, we forget, forget the Trent. The American Civil War was gonna hit England a lot harder than you might think, because they were not gonna be able to get cotton. So, they were sort of on the south side. And James Mason and John Siddell got passage on an English ship, the Trent, to go to Europe and get money, get arms, and put up cotton as collateral. You know, the North considered Siddell and Mason traitors. So, you know, basically an American uh, frigate pulled up next to him and says, we're boarding your ship and we're taking the guys. And that's when the shitstorm happened. If an American ship boards an English ship in international waters, it's the same thing as invading their country. The Trent Affair might not be as well known as major Civil War battles, but historically, we were this close to getting in a war with England while we were fighting against our own brothers here at home. Thankfully, cool heads prevailed because it could have been an absolute disaster. I mean, it looks in great shape. Your paperwork's great. Um, the number you were looking for? I'm asking 15,000 for it. To me, it sounds high, okay? Because a nerd like me, and obviously a nerd like you, know exactly what the Trent is. 99% of the people in this world do not. And I'm thinking like five grand. Oh. Probably the least I could take for it would be 12,000. I, I can't do it. It's historically significant, but it doesn't have a general's name on the side of it that fought at the Battle of Gettysburg or something like that. Tell you what, I'll go six grand. I'm not a penny more. You can meet me at nine, we've got a deal. No, I go six. I certainly appreciate your time. I'll just have to hang on to it. All right. Thank you very um, much. Change your mind. Come on back. Thank you. When he offered me $5,000, I was tempted to pull the sword out and show him what it was really used for. I'm just not prepared to sell it at that price. What do we got here? I have a World War II leather jacket worn by a real war hero. I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my World War II fighter jacket. I got the jacket from an old roommate. I have a lot of bills to pay. I'm hoping to get 10,000 bucks. I'd probably take as low as 4,000. All right, so what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. I feel it's worth 10,000 bucks. This is a genuine military jacket. I can see that. That's easy to tell. On the back collar, actually, is US Navy. I'm pretty sure the Hellhawks were US Army Air Corps. That can very easily be an army unit. And they just acquired some Navy jackets. It's just a little weird to me. I know a guy who will know everything about this jacket. Let me have him look at this thing. Sure. And he will tell me everything about it. Sounds great. If this genuinely belonged to a Hellhawks pilot, it could be worth a lot of money. But I'm almost certain it should be from the US Army, not the US Navy. So I called in my buddy Mark to take a good look at it. So what are your concerns with the jacket? Okay, he believes the jacket's from World War II, but as far as I know, the Hellhawks were Army Air Corps, not the Navy. There was a group called the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. In terms of Heide Cooper himself, he was in the Hellhawks. I did find him listed in the Hellhawks as a member of the unit. The problem is he was not the member of the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. The Hellhawks is just the nickname for a group. Really? Yeah. 
It isn't the official name. So you also had a Marine Corps group that was VMF 213 that were the Hellhawks also in World War II. And Heide Cooper is somebody that was in VMF 213. And they were a naval air group, but it is a, a very nice World War II fighter jacket, less common than the Army fighter jackets. Thanks a lot, man. You're the best. Not a problem. Hey, this Mark, helps. Appreciate the info. The squadrons get known by the nicknames, but that's not their official name. So you get some confusion when you get an overlap of the same name and two different units. Now, um, you will not get $10,000 for it. But we do have a World War II fighter jacket that I'd be willing to pay like $1,500 for. Yeah, I, I agree with you now that I know more. 10 grand is high, but uh, it's got so much history. I'd take 4,000 bucks for it. It's very interesting. The price doesn't go as much as they were a few years ago. I'll give you 2,000 cash right now. 2,500? No. No. I'd go 2,000, not a penny more. <sighs> Let's make a deal. OK. All right, meet you right up there. We'll All write right. it up. Thank you. I got to be honest, I was a little bummed when Mark told me it was from a different Hellhawks. But it's still a cool jacket, and I think collectors will definitely be lining up for something like this. Heather, how are you? I'm doing great. I have an 1861 coin that my grandfather gave to me before he passed away. OK. Yeah, it's an 1861 Half Eagle. It's definitely cool, man. I brought down an 1861 coin that my grandfather gave to me. He said that it had some value. He said, always keep it. I need some home improvements done, and I'm just hoping for the best at this point. Oh, this is cool. You know why they call it a Half Eagle? No, I don't. OK, well, it's a $5 gold piece. And her standard gold coin was the Eagle. That's what everyone called it. And that was a $10 gold piece. Oh, OK. The incredible cool thing is, generally, you never see one with a C on the back of it. What's the C? OK. Normally, there's nothing there. That means it was from the Philadelphia Met, where that's where we made most of our coins during this time period. But believe it or not, for a while, there was a mint in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, really? OK. It, it's a neat American coin. You know why we have a mint in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina? Nope. It's because there was the Carolina gold rush. The gold was there, and we could um, strike the coins there. So if it's real, this is worth a lot more than a Philadelphia coin, since it's from Charlotte. Comparatively, it is much, much more rare. You have to understand, this was during the Civil War. And when countries like England got these coins from selling supplies like guns to the United States, a lot of the times they would melt them down and reuse the gold for their own coins. And that's one of the reasons why so few of these coins exist anymore. So how much did you want for it? To be honest with you, I'm not sure. This is one of the most counterfeited coins. Oh. It's got right around $350 worth of gold in it. You take a $350 hunk of gold, turn it to a $10,000 coin, makes it pretty profitable, yeah. Do you want me to get Mike? Yeah, go ahead and get him. Who's Mike? Um, he's the guy who handles all my coins here. He knows a little bit more than me, just a little bit. Oh, OK. <laughs> What's up, Rick? 1861 Charlotte. That's a rare one. 1861 Philadelphia. There was over 700,000 of those. We're talking five, 600 bucks. Uh, with a C, we're talking a whole lot more. 20 times as much. That's good news. That's yes. great news. Yes, absolutely. So this is a rare find, then? Well, that's if it's real. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to take a look at the uh, mint mark. and. Oh, uh, absolutely. OK. What are you looking for exactly? Uh, I'm just looking at the letter C and seeing if it is uh, consistent with the rest of the coin. How's it look? After looking at it, yes, I believe that it is a uh, authentic Charlotte That's... minted coin. That's awesome. awesome news. So what's it worth? Uh, in this condition, I would say on a good day, You could get about 15000 for wow. this coin. 15 So me having this in my pocket earlier was not a good thing then. Mm, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. All right, beat it, Mike. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. No, hey, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. You. Good luck, guys. It's really cool this coin turned out to be authentic. The guy seemed really happy, and he should be. Wow, so what do you, you want to do? 
7,500 bucks. Mm, no. 12. I think you'll do just fine. I still have to send this off. Things can pop up when I send it off. They can give it a weird grading because they might say it's been cleaned. OK. I end up assuming all the risk. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's somewhat split the difference. About 95. I'll go eight grand, not a penny more. Hmm. Well, I'm good. Eight grand. All right. Good doing business. Come on, man. I'll write you up. You got it. All right, thank you. I was very excited when I heard the value of this coin. Very happy with the eight grand. This is really going to help me in finishing my home remodel. What is this? I have Keith Herring artwork. OK, cool. Where in the hell did you get these? I got them from a friend who got them from Keith Herring's Lover's Lover. Oh, Keith Herring's Lover's Lover. Yes. What a tangled web we weave. <laughs> <laughs> I helped out a friend, and he gave me this artwork. I thought it was a little cartoonish and childish, but as soon as I did some research on it, I started to appreciate it, and I hope to walk out of here with a big pile of money. If they're real, it's mega cool. It really is. These might not look like much, but Keith Haring's art really did make a big social impact in the 1980s. I mean, the guy is an icon. I love it when I have a recognizable artist like Herring in my shop. If they're originals, they're worth a lot of money. Yes. And do you want to sell them? I want to sell them. And how much do you want for them? Uh, 75,000. Let me have someone check these out, and if he says they're legit, we'll do something. Looking forward to it. Thank I'll be right back, man. I'm really excited to have somebody look at it. I think that it's rare, and I hope they're worth a lot of money. These are the herrings you were telling me about. Um, alleged herrings. Alleged, alleged <laughs> herrings, OK. These are great. The thing about Keith Herring, you see a Keith Herring, you know it's a Keith Herring. It wouldn't be a stretch to call him the, the world's first fine art cartoonist. <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of his thing. As a matter of fact, you see the outline on the pieces? He did that intentionally to make it seem like the viewer was looking at a television screen, you know, watching a cartoon. Uh, got started as a tagger. Actually did a lot of these same characters in the New York subway system. That's kind of how he got his start. OK. And he took a lot of pride in coming up with these really simple, but yet really iconic and identifiable figures. And I see a lot of them in here. You see, you've got the radiant baby. He was very well known for the baby. The, the three-eyed, smiley face, that was uh, another big thing. The snake, so very unique. OK, so do you think they're real? That is a real concern. So let me see if I can identify anything that tips me off one way or the other. It's definitely not a print. You can see the inks. You can see where they're laid on and would be applied with a, a tip. So it's definitely a one of a kind. Now, I'm looking at the signature, and it looks pretty good. He almost always put the K in there, K period herring, and the cross is actually left over from his tagging days. Okay. So that's kind of an identifying symbol there. And he would comment on consumerism. You've got the dollar bill there. He would comment on religion. He always incorporated a cross into his work. So I don't think they're forgeries. I think they're legitimate herring originals. Me too. OK, so what do you think they're worth? You know, pop art is doing really well right now. All right. Andy Warhol is just through the roof, and Herring is certainly in that group. I could see them in a gallery in New York in the forty dollars to $50,000 range. Each. Each. Yes. OK. Thanks, Mike. Hey, pleasure as always. Thank Chip, you very much. It was much. nice meeting you. You've got some nice pieces here. <sighs> OK. So. I'll give you 45 grand for them. Um, I can probably find them wholesale for 30 grand a piece. I would say that 50,000 and they're yours. That's an easy $10,000 in your pocket. I'll go 48 grand. That's what I'll go. 
You want 48,000, I will give you 48,000. That's not a penny more. I have a store to run. 49,000? No. Find someone else to pay you that much money cash. But you won't find it here in this town. All right, deal. Okay, man. All right, I'll meet you right up front, and um, we'll do some paperwork. All right. Only in America can you bring a couple cartoon figures in to a pawn shop and walk out with $48,000. That's a brand new truck, a nice one. A guy called me the other day and said he had an antique circus item for me. So he brought it by today and set it up out back. And now I'm going to go check it out. <laughs> That is cool. <laughs> you go ahead and turn that off. So this is a calliope, right? Yes, it is. They would put this inside the tent to play when the circus would start. OK. People either love the sound of these things or absolutely hate them. <laughs> the calliope is very Americana. It signifies the circus is coming to town. This calliope has 43 notes and runs on air. I'd like to sell it today because I've got a space problem. I'd be wonderful to get 5,600. Where in the hell did you get it? I manufacture amusement park attractions, and I got it from a circus family in Ohio. OK. I absolutely love these things because there's real science here. I mean, this is like early acoustic designs. I could definitely nerd out on this thing. <laughs> so do you know anything about it? This is a Tangley model CA43 made in 1924 by the Tangley Calliope Company. And this thing was made for compressed air, not steam? Right. Th that's what Tangley was known for. They, they, they called it the air calliope. And they marketed it to people who didn't want to bother with a boiler. Do you have the case that these went in? Yes, I do. That, this case is for transporting the pipes. As you can see, they're graduated. All right. I'm no circus expert, but I know things associated with the big top can bring big money. This thing, though, does look in pretty rough shape. So I need to know if it's even worth the cost of restoration before I make an offer. <sighs> There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done to this thing. This front right here is replaced. Um, we have screwed up keys here. I don't think they're all going to work exactly right. Yeah, there's some maintenance. So how much do you want for it? About half the restored value. 5,600. All right. Um, do you mind if I have someone look at it? Because to resell this thing, I have to make it look like a piece of furniture. I mean, if someone puts this in their house, they can't use that compressor. No, go ahead. Give me like five minutes. I'm going to go give someone a call. OK. I'm very confident that the actual expert would back me up because it has significant antique value. What you got for me today? This. <laughs> wow. Amazing piece of history right here. The calliope has a real unique sound. And as soon as you hear it, it brings back memory of your childhood. You're just all excited, and you want to see the tent and eat cotton candy and look at the elephants and lions and tigers and bears. I always found that the uh, clown's pretty creepy. What about you? Clowns are scare the heck out of me. <laughs> what do you guys need to know about this thing? First, I need to know how much it would cost to make it look pretty and run right. We'll definitely call the right guy. <laughs> but we'll have to tear into it and take a look real quick. All right, we'll do your magic. Right. Calliope's appeal to everyone, from a little kid to an old man. Most of them are automatons that will play pre-done music, but this one in particular was designed where you would need a player to play it. It's old. <laughs> well, looks like it's going to need a little bit of work. You can see the original wood in there, some really nice wood. We got some good bones to work with. A couple of the hoses are going to need to get changed out, but uh, otherwise it looks good. I don't see any rot. Everything's there, and that's the, the best part about it. OK. You're probably looking at about $1,000 for all the woodworking, and then maybe two or three for a compressor. All restored and done, these definitely get 
10 to 12,000 once they've been modernized. All right, you gave me something to work with. Thanks, Roy, appreciate it, man. All right, Rick, thanks for having me. If Rick does pick up the Calliope, I'm very excited to work on this one. It'll look so different. Rick's gonna be absolutely surprised. Oh, my God. Um, another project from hell. Okay. Um, it's going to sit around from anywhere from two weeks to five years. There's just not a lot of people out there in the market for a calliope. You know, it, it sounds like a great investment. Give me you 5600 and then give Roy like $2,000, and I might get $10,000 for it. You know what? I would give you 4,000 and not a penny more. That, that's the most I can go. Deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's now my problem, I guess. Uh, let me go get you some money. Come on. All right. I figured 4,000 was within the absolute lowest of my ideas. I think I'll take my four grand and tango down to Argentina. What do we have here? It's a 16 millimeter camera, and it's made by Bernd Maurer. OK. Uh, we're going to make a newsreel or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my 16 millimeter camera. I found it in the attic of an old theater. I'm having a baby, and I want to sell it because I need lots of baby gear. I would like to get 2000 for the camera, but I maybe will take a little bit lower. This is really uber, uber cool. Do you know anything about it? I do know it's a burnt Maurer camera. OK. And um, the lens, you know, it's Bell and Howe. They were really big on lenses back then. Uh-huh. Rarely back then did the camera maker make the lenses. There's some early cameras that go for a lot of money. The thing is, this particular brand, I'm not real familiar with. Uh, I'm assuming you want to sell this? I do want to sell it. And how much do you want for it? I was thinking maybe 2000 Um, One of the problems you have here is I don't see any stickers on it or anything. Um, it's got, you don't have the plug for it, do you? I don't. Are, this is one of the things that hurts me, and I don't know. I don't know if everything works. And uh, it's got a really bizarro brand. That's some weird stuff you have going on. Uh, do, you, do you mind if I call somebody up? Just, I mean, just try and figure out what I can get out of this thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hang out a minute. I'm going to go give him a call. All right. Older movie cameras always go for good money, but this particular one, I'm not sure on the value. So I called in my buddy Martin that deals in old Hollywood memorabilia to help me out. Well, it's in fantastic condition. It's a Burnt and Maurer camera. So it's Eric Burnt and Johnny Maurer got together in 1934. They formed a partnership to build cameras. This guy, John Maurer, to me, he was like the Les Paul to the guitar. OK. He has 90 patents during his lifetime. They are fantastic cameras. It's also very, very rare. Uh, it's really neat, but I don't know what it's worth. It is, it's, it's a fantastic camera. We don't know whether it works or not, which can have some impact, but I think possibly it could be made to work. Burnt and Mara cameras are very rare. As an auctioneer, I look at auction records to see what have similar cameras sold in the past. And the reality is that none of these have, have been brought to the market. Any of these that are around today are in museums such as Eastman House. So that, of course, adds value. At auction, and we were to take this to auction, we would put a conservative auction estimate of two to 4000 on it. And I think we should sell it in the range of $4,000. OK. Thank you. Which is a good number. Yeah. OK. All right, well, thanks, man. Pleasure. Good luck. Thank you. Yes. The camera is in great condition. So this is something that you have it in on the shelf in your living room. You have it in your office. And you're holding an asset that potentially will appreciate in years to come. OK. So I mean, what's the best you'll take for it? I would like 3000 for it. That's not going to happen. <laughs> OK? But you uh, love it. You want to take it oh, home. I, I do. Like I said, I, I absolutely love this camera. I think it's amazing. And um, how much do you love it? Well, I, I love it a lot. But this is my problem. <laughs> I'd have to resell it, OK? Oh. I, I don't know if everything works. I'll give you 1400 bucks for it. OK, how about 2000 uh, No, 1500 is what I'll go. 
because there's still a lot of questions. And if everything in here is trashed, I might get a thousand. That's why I will go fifteen hundred, not a penny more, because this is straight up gambling. <laughs> These right here, the roulette wheels. <laughs> <laughs> How about sixteen hundred? How about fifteen fifty? Okay, fine. <laughs> we have a deal then. Okay. okay, great. I'll meet you right over there, and I'll write this up, and you never have to carry it again as long as you live. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I made fifteen fifty, and I'm going to buy a lot of diapers and baby things now. What do we got here? I found uh, a foreclosed house that I bought. I was kind of cleaning out a bunch of junk in there, and came across this book in a, a closet, kind of stuff in the back corner. And uh, boom, that's what I came across. Whoa, a Martha Washington $1 bill. This is pretty amazing. Coming to the pawn shop today to sell this dollar that I found with Martha Washington on it. I'm hoping to sell the dollar for about 1,500 bucks. It'll be a nice little cushion. I'll probably buy something cool, you know, uh, maybe a hot tub or a pool table or something like that to put the go with the house. You know, to this day when they uh, make the plates for, for a bill, one guy does the engraving for the front, one guy does the portrait, hmm. and then a third person does the back, because they never want one person to engrave it all, because if one guy can engrave everything for a bill, uh -huh. he can engrave another bill. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> silver certificates were bills. that was a promise to give you silver dollars for your money. So if you had a $10 bill that was a silver certificate, you could go to the treasury, and they would give you 10 silver dollars for your $10 bill. What had ended up happening is the price of silver started going up, and the amount of silver in a silver dollar was worth more than a dollar. Finally, the government had to say, hey, enough. We're going to run out of silver. So it's just in incredibly good shape. Luckily, it was in this, in this book. How much are you looking to get out of it? Uh, you know, I looked online a little bit, and um, what I could see is, is it you know, was worth around 1500 bucks. I mean, it's in really good shape. Do we need to get it graded? Well, that, that's the weird thing. When it's in this good a shape, you really do need to get it graded. But there's 10 grades of a pristine bill. I mean, this thing can be worth anywhere from between 1,000 and 10,000. 10,000? Oh, my gosh. It, it, it all depends on how it grades out, and there's a lot of variables when it comes to paper money. I have a friend who's in town right now, and he grades bills. I'm going to get him down here. He'll tell me what grade it is and help me out on the price a little bit, and we'll go from there. Okay? Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks. Be right back, man. So hearing that it could be worth $10,000, I'm pretty stoked. Um, that'd be amazing. How's it going, buddy? Hey, Rick, how are you? How's it going, man? Nice to meet you, Peter. Hey, Brian. Uh, this is the, you know, Martha $1 bill. It's in, it's in great shape, and, um, but it's that <laughs> weirdness with paper money and um, you guys and your little grading weirdness. Sure, sure. <laughs> this is fantastic. My name is Peter Trillia and I work for a company called Stacks Bowers Galleries. I'm an expert in rare United States paper currency. Well, this is an 1891 $1 silver certificate. Well, the overall condition is pretty fantastic, actually. Grab me a tray real quick. Yeah, please, thank you. I brought my light here. OK, so as you know, paper currency is it's very fragile, um, unlike coins. You can kind of fool around. You can iron. You can enhance uh, the condition of a bill. But. Well, this is actually really, this is really, really high grade. At first glance, uh, appears to be flawless. And if so, could be worth upwards of $20,000. Wow. Um, it, it is an absolutely awesome condition. The, the best a bill can be is gem crisp uncirculated. And the worst is a pour. And this is kind of towards the top end of the range. OK. However. It does have a slight, very slight center fold, uh, which takes it out of, the, out of the uncirculated category. It is not in the top range. As far as value, I would put a conservative retail value around $1,500. OK. But it's a cool find here. Yeah, I mean, I'm stoked. I just love the fact that you're saying Martha Washington is on a center fold. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate Good it. Good time, Rick. Thank you, buddy. Corey, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Nice meeting you. Take care. If the shop is able to acquire this bill, I think it's a fantastic buy for them. They should have no issue selling it quickly. So the man said $1,500. Uh, what do you say, man? He said $1,500 was a fair retail value, okay. OK? And I have to make a living. 
So I'll give you 800 bucks. 800 bucks? Oh, man, you're yes. killing me. She just got offered $800 for a $1 bill. Yeah, I That I you get, found. I, I get you guys got to make a living, but come on, man. 1400 Tell you what, I'll give you a grand for it. I think it'll sell really quick. Can you do 1200 man? I will go 1100 bucks. I won't go a penny more. That's what I can do. I did find it in the book, um, so I can't really complain about that. So, all right, thank deal. you guys, man. Right, Come with me, we'll do some paperwork. Walked in the shop with a book and a dollar bill, and uh, now I'm leaving with $1,100 in my pocket. What do we got here? Well, I got a photograph of Orson Welles that I believe is signed by him. You may be interested in. That is pretty damn cool. And it's from Citizen Kane. It couldn't be a better picture, too, because you have a picture of Orson Welles, and behind Orson Welles is a picture of Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather passed away. He was a movie buff. And I was going through some of my grandfather's photos and found this photo that was signed by Orson Welles. There's no sentimental value to me. Uh, I'm not a big movie buff like my grandfather was. This autograph, it sort of looks like gobbledygook. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of hard to make out the whole Orson Welles out of that. Did you have an idea what you wanted for it? I was thinking, this 5,000. <sighs> I mean, if it's real, it's really cool. I mean, because I can't think of something better to have Orson Welles' signature on than basically this photo right here. I think it adds a lot of value because it's signed on this picture as opposed to signed on one of his normal publicity photos or something like that. Good. Let me get my buddy down here. He'll take a look at it. And if it is real, we'll talk. Sounds good. I don't know much about the photo, so I think an expert's great. So, I mean, obviously why I called you down here is, is that signature legit? Um, it's rare to see anything kind of from a movie sign. Usually it's, you know, especially from this period. Usually the stuff is, you know, like a pose shot or a promo shot they would send out. It's rare that you'd see something from a film. So um, I'm kind of highly skeptical about this one. I do want to look at the ink and just kind of get a feel for what he signed this in. And kind of right away you could see here, this is, you know, basically like a, a liquid type ink. So it's not a fountain pen. Kind of see how it's kind of bled off through here. So we do have a live pen here. The next thing, pretty familiar with this guy's signature, and he was just very sloppy. And the thing I kind of look for is a rush signature from him. Sometimes connected all the way, sometimes he didn't. And here's a great example. Rush signature you could see here, where he starts off here, and he's just kind of flying through this whole thing. OK, so is it real? Well, based on everything I've seen here, um, no question. Signature's perfect to me. Absolutely looks great on the photo. So what's it worth, you think? Well, what I haven't seen is something from Citizen Kane. Based on that, perfect signature, no personalizations, which definitely helps the piece. I could see this easily being worth $2,600, dollars I mean, that's that's good. That's a fair price. I, I didn't know what it was worth to start with. Right. I didn't even know if that was his signature. Well, thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. One thing I could say about Citizen Kane, still very popular. Still studied in film school. I mean, people really know this movie. And I think that image, it's so iconic. I think that piece would fly right off the shelves. So with all that said, what's your best price on this thing? You know, with the picture being really good and clear and the way the signature flows, can you go 2200 Nope. Go 1200 I mean, I got a business. I mean, I got to frame this thing, everything else. It's um, it's really cool, but I got to sell it. $1,800? I'll tell you what, I'll give you 1500 bucks, not a penny more. That's fair, 1500 All right, cool, man. Uh, we'll go do some paperwork, and Thanks. maybe you can take a trip to Xanadu or something. <laughs> What do we got here? Um, this is a Marc Chagall print that I have for you. OK. Do you know who Marc Chagall was? Sort of. Very famous painter. He's a post-impressionist. You know the difference between like impressionism and post-impressionism? Not really. The easiest way to, I always explain it to people is impressionism, blurry. Post-impressionism, really blurry. <laughs> <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my Marc Chagall print. I'm looking to get $1,000 for my Marc Chagall print, and I don't think I'll be willing to go any lower than that. 
I sell the Chagall print today, I'll probably pay some bills. I think this is really, really neat. Where'd you get it? Um, so I have a wealthy aunt, and she gave it to me. But I just, it really just doesn't go with the decor of my house. All right. Uh, there's probably like two dozen artists in the world where you just look at their art and go, OK, that's, a, that's Picasso or Picasso-esque right. or Renoir. Chagall is one of those people. Mark Chagall, 500 years from now, they'll still be talking about his paintings, and they'll still be worth money. Cool. He lived a long time. He lived into his 90s, I think it was. Oh, wow. This guy was hanging out in Paris with, like, Renoir and, you know, Picasso and all those guys back at, like, the turn of the century. I mean, just, like, there was all these new artists popping up everywhere and these new styles of painting. If you ever get a chance to go to Paris, okay. go to the Paris Opera House, he painted the entire ceiling. Oh, wow. And it looks like a lithograph. Litho means stone and graph means writing. OK. So it's stone writing. So. Um, originally, what it was is they would take stones, I mean, a, a big giant piece of limestone, mm -hmm. completely flat, and they would etch into it the image. Oh, wow. OK, one for each color. So on each impression, you would carve in what would be blue. You would ink the stone. Put the, the paper on top. Then put like a 2,000 pound stone on top of it and press the ink into the paper, and then move on to the next stone for the next color, and then the next. That's quite the process. Um, yes, and over the years, they've changed that process, uh, made it a lot simpler, but that's basically lithography. OK. So how much you want for it? Um, I don't, maybe around $1,000 or so. Did you get any paperwork on it? I don't have any paperwork with it. OK, so we'll call it Mark Chagall-esque until we make sure it's Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, OK, give, give me a minute or two. Um, let me get someone down here to take a look at it so we can figure out exactly what it is. Sounds okay? great. I'll be right back. I'm trying to be an artist, but sausage fingers, I barely hold a brush. So it looks Chagall. That is an image by Chagall. So Chagall discovered lithography after he was already very, very famous. He started doing lithography at the age of 63. But the person he learned it with was the absolute master, Morlo. Chagall brought his skills as a painter and his, as a colorist to this medium, and he changed the standards of all lithography. This is Captain Bryaxis's dream. In fact, it's one of his most famous images. It's rumored he literally just slept on the floor of the print shop during the production of, of this particular work to ensure his colors, because the color was really the key to Chagall. That's the thing that set him apart. With Chagall, usually I see like images and a white background. It's yeah, it's very dark. But this particular image is from a work called Daphnis and Chloe. It's a second century Greek poem. This was put out as a illustrated book. If you look very closely, you're going to see a bit of a crease here. And that's because this is a double panel work. So it's a little more valuable, and it's the only double panel that was in the overall set. OK. So the big question, what's it worth? If this was in a gallery in San Francisco, New York, it's worth at least $8,000. Awesome. OK. <laughs> All right, sweet, dude. I appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you very much. All right, good luck to you guys. So you still want 1000 Um, No, obviously. <laughs> I'd like a little bit more than that now. Um, I understand that. I'll tell you what, I'll give you three grand for it. Well, I, that's kind of low. He just said it was eight. Uh, that's in a nice gallery in New York or San Francisco where they have really high markups. Got What's a nice best, establishment what, what is your here. best price on it? Lowest, 6000 I'll give you four grand. Five. I'll give you $4,500, not a penny more. I'll take 45. Deal. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll meet you right over there and do some paperwork. Cool. Thank you very much. <sighs> this is what happens when you call it an expert. You pay more money. All right, what do we got here? I got a couple of Scottish blades here. Uh, they were handed down from me from my dad, which was handed down to him from his father. So basically, my grandfather. OK. <laughs> My grandfather was overseas around World War II, and he had bought these over there, so they, they do mean a lot to me. So I believe with both of them, I'd be able to get at least 4,000 out of it. So do you know anything about these? Yes, I've done some research on these online, mm -hmm. and uh, found this one's called a dirk, and this is the dagger. 
Okay. And they're around the 18th century. So uh, what would you like to do with these? Well, I'd like to sell them. Do you know how much you want for them? With the set, 4000 <sighs> Yeah, that's not gonna happen. First off, I can tell you right off, this is a reproduction. Really? Yeah. This is not silver. This is really poorly sandcasted all along here. How can you tell it's not silver? Because it looks nothing like silver. Look at this. This is silver. Silver is the most reflective metal there is. You can see the difference in color in them. When silver oxidizes, it turns black. This one's already turning green. Right. OK. This is photo etching along here. But it's not done by hand or anything like that. Photo etching is a chemical process. They put a photo negative above the blade. They put some chemicals on the blade. They blast some light on it. The acid reacts with the light and zap, it's there. And it's not as detailed and it doesn't look as good. My guess is your grandpa didn't get this in Scotland. He probably picked this up a lot later, maybe the 70s or the 80s. Hmm, I wouldn't think my grandfather would pick up something that wasn't authentic. Uh, well, but this one I'm confident is not worth anything. That, that really sucks. I can see the guy's pretty disappointed. One of the toughest parts of my job is telling people that their prized family possession is fake. Uh, this, on the other hand, looks real. I really like this. I mean, I love the handle. That's a lot of work right there. It's definitely silver. Someone went the trouble of putting a topaz on the bottom of it, but it looks like it's a modern cut stone. Um, it's got some hallmarks on the back of it. And the hallmarks are gonna tell us where it's made, who it's made by, what year it's made. The problem is I don't know what all they all mean. So I'd like to call on an expert, have them check it out. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Thank you. I would hate to walk out of here knowing that both of my knives are fake. So I'm hoping at least the dagger will be authentic. My name's Jeff. I'm an expert in knives and militaria. If you could just imagine the journey that these items have been on, what they may have been used for, who may have carried it, uh, it's just absolutely amazing to me. So what are your concerns about it? Uh, there's a few things. I can't read the hallmarks on the back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they mean. And he was saying he thinks it's 200 years old, and this is a modern cut stone on the top of it. And looking at this dagger, I can tell that uh, this is a proper form of a Scottish dagger. The bent shape at the end of the handle here was actually intentional. They would slip this into their sock, this would protrude. It was allowing them to easily grab the dagger. Oh, okay. The handle is carved ebony. They used dark woods and carved their design. Again, this is the outwardly facing design, smooth on the backside where it would be against the skin. The stone at the end of the handle here, this is called a cairngorn. It's very common for these stones to fall out and be replaced. Does that affect the value? No. You'll also see that this is mounted in silver, and silversmiths always hallmarked their work. The hallmarks will tell us the rest of the story. All right, cool. I can tell by the markings that this was made in Scotland, has the Scottish thistle mark on it. There's also a Birmingham mark. The lowercase a tells us that this was 1900. Okay, so what do you think something like this is worth? These will go anywhere from 800 to $1,200. Okay. Now that Jeff has confirmed this dagger is 100% real, I definitely want it. The only question is, how much do I have to pay for it? So what do you want for it? Well, I'm thinking probably around $800. That's not gonna happen. What do you, maybe six. I give you like 400 bucks for it. That's just too low. Could you do any more than that? I'll go 500 bucks. $500? That would be the best you could do? Yeah, not a penny more. Not a penny more. Okay, well, I think we'll do that. Okay, all right, 500 bucks. Let's go do some paperwork. I'm okay with that $500. I was hoping for a little bit more, but it's still a lot of money. Corey, Rick, get over here and look at this thing. Pops, it's some kind of motorcycle tractor thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Rokon Trailbreaker two-wheel drive off-road motorcycle. I think it looks like you should have a bucket loader in the front of it, dude. I decided to come to the pawn shop today to sell my old two-wheel drive trail breaker motorcycle. It's designed to go like up in the rough, rough country. You can go places on this bike. You just cannot go with anything other than maybe a horse 
This thing is definitely cool. Where'd you get it? I actually got it uh, right after I graduated from high school. I used to live in Barstow, California, so that's like, you know, heaven for bike riders. And uh, had it for a couple of years, and then my brother and I went on the road as musicians, so I gave it to my cousin, and he gave it back to me a couple of weeks ago. I haven't seen it in 30 years. It's uh, kind of cool to see it again, but I don't want it. I'm, I'm ready to get rid of it. You know, I've off-roaded my whole life, and this is just cool. These were like high-tech when they came out. It's two-wheel drive. It will go anywhere. They weren't real fast, though. Maybe 15, 20 miles an hour tops downhill, <laughs> <laughs> but I had a blast with it. These things were designed to take you places where no other vehicle could. I mean, you can practically scale walls and go up and down trails that would make a horse think twice. What's up with the huge metal things on the tires, man? Three reasons. They won't fill up with mud when you're off-roading. You can also fill them full of gas. So you're just rolling around with gas in your wheels flying around? Yeah. The reason they were designed to hold gas in the wheels is so that you could ride to a very remote area and still have enough gas to come back. Also, you seal them up with gas, they will float. Oh, shit. Gasoline is lighter than water, and when there's no gas in them, it's air, so it's definitely lighter than water, so the thing will float. If you're in a stream, you can walk it across like that. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. We, I drove in the desert, so. You know, I've always really wanted one of these, but it's rough, though. It's not very good condition. Uh, it's obviously got a flat tire. Engine doesn't turn over. I am not a mechanic, but I'm sure it could be brought up to spec fairly simply. It feels like it's still got compression. It just doesn't have a carburetor. This thing is rough, but I think if I can get it for the right price, it's worth it. Worst case, I'll part it out. But man, I really want to ride this thing. So how much were you looking to sell this thing for? I thought uh, if I could get 2000 I mean, that's kind of what I paid for it, but it's an antique now, so I thought maybe there was some value there. But uh, <laughs> well, don't uh, laugh. Yeah, I mean, if this thing was in good shape, I might consider that, but this thing needs like one of everything. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 500 bucks for the thing. And that's just because I think it's really cool. I'm not gonna go one penny more. Well, okay, I don't wanna put it back in the truck. <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, man. Cool. I am pumped we got this thing for such a great price. I just need to bring it to my buddy Rick Dale, see if he can fix it up, and if he can, I just might keep it for myself. A few weeks ago, I dropped off the Rokon Trailbreaker with Rick Dale. He just called to see if I could meet him out in the desert. So Chum, Corey, and I are on our way to meet him. I'm not sure what he's got up his sleeve, but I hope it's cool. Where the hell is he? guys <laughs> had to give a little trial spin <laughs> so what do you think i think it's great i'll tell you what man i have my doubts about this but it looks pretty good so what happened uh you know i had to gut the thing and take everything off and rebuild everything on it everything on this bike was dented bent twisted you know because they use them just to climb up everything and you know they're abused really hard and um getting everything in sync from the, the gearbox to the to the rear wheel, it was a nightmare. <laughs> You'd think I'd be used to the crap that Rick brings in, but this Rokon was a nightmare. It absolutely went over the top. The parts are obsolete. You can't find parts for the 69 at all. The brake system, it's not, not anything you could buy. So we had to make these discs, uh, circle discs, to fit inside there so we had brakes. Rick Dale did an amazing job, but he's making me a little nervous with everything he had to do, and I just hear the dollars racking up. Okay, well, I bought it for 500 so what's the damage? <laughs> All right, well, restoration cost is 2800 Okay, that's not, that's not really bad. So what do you think we could sell it for? I think you should have no problem getting five grand out of it at all. Proves me wrong, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. So, Tom, you want to take it for a ride? Hell yeah. I don't think so. I'm taking it for a ride. Time and time again, Rick Dale delivers. It's getting to the point where he just sneeze on something and he makes me money. He never disappoints. Get it on, Rick, let's go.
Hey, what do we got here? Hi, how's it going? I have this Allen Adler Sterling Silver Flatware. Okay. A friend of mine gave it to me. Just and gave it to you? Yeah, I think it was kind of sentimental for her, but not so much for me. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> I've done some research online, and I heard that Alan Adler made flatware for Michael Jackson and Katherine Hepburn, and I'm hoping I can get 6,800. Oh, iced teaspoons, cool. Yeah, those are really cool, I love those. Alan Adler was silversmith to the stars. Paul Newman, Katherine Hepburn, Frank Sinatra, this was high-end fancy stuff that was required in high society. He did that whole arts and craft looking thing. He never did the crazy scroll work or the really ornate patterns. It was really simple. I think this design was designed in like the late 60s. Yeah. And one thing you got here that's cool is it's nicer than scrap. It's the best way to put it. People still collect this stuff and uh, it's resellable. The whole dinner party thing is kind of a lost art. But this stuff has that Hollywood glitz and glamour associated with it. So I think I can resell it, but it's still a thin market and I have to be careful what I pay for it. I believe there's like 84 pieces in here. Okay. Seven. Seven. Standard is eight. Okay. Uh, and we have seven. You don't have a full set here. You don't have a full setting for eight. You got some neat pieces and everything like that. When I get a set like this in, it's a lot of work to sell it. You know, so I have to put it all online individually because someone's not going to really want to buy only a partial set. What did you want for this? Uh, I was thinking like 6800 I mean, if you were out to go buy this stuff retail, it would probably cost you $10,000 at least. If you looked up online, those are probably the prices you saw. Yeah. That's why I thought 6800 was really reasonable. Um, I... If I'm lucky, I'll probably get around six grand for it. That's why I'll give you three grand. <laughs> three grand? It, oh, it, man. It's You're years of work me. selling this, cataloging it. It is a literal nightmare doing this. I said 6,800 and you said three grand. Can you meet me in the middle? What, at 3,200? No, more like 4,500 seems fair. You said you'd make six grand, so no, I'm still leaving you I wouldn't make six grand. I hope to get right around six thousand dollars if I sell it okay. over the course of the next two or three years. I'll tell you Come what. On. I, I I will give you thirty-eight hundred dollars. I will not give you a penny more, and that's what I will give you. Okay. How about four thousand? How I'm about thirty-eight hundred? Way down. I was at sixty-eight hundred. Okay. I'm, I'm really being fair. It's nothing about being fair. I'm just. It's the reality of life. Thirty-nine hundred. Come All right, on. Thirty-nine hundred. Really? It's, 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 it's <laughs> so 3850. All right. It's a deal. I'll meet you right over there okay. and um, give you some money. Okay, thank okay? thanks. <sighs> I just bought myself a bunch of work. 3850 was a little lower than I planned to even consider, but I kind of feel good that I got Rick to go just a little above his lowest price he said he would pay me. I got a call from a guy with a collection of 1950s cowboy toys. So me and Corey are on our way to go check them out. Hello. Hello. Hear about the toys? Come on in. This is what I called you about. Damn, there is a lot of stuff here. This is like my museum. You don't really strike me as the cowboy type. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I'm always like a Zora type. <laughs> I've decided to call the guys at the pawn shop to come over to see if they're interested in buying my whole Western toy collection. The reason I'm going to sell this collection is it's time to move on. I'm leaving this house. I just don't want to lug this around anymore. This whole collection is worth about thirty dollars to $40,000. I would like to get at least 15000 for it. So what was it about the Lone Ranger that got your blood pumping there? The reason I really liked Lone Ranger because he was really an outstanding citizen, even through the day he, he died. He really was. Kind of like me and you. <laughs> The Lone Ranger is a classic. The show started back in the 30s on the radio and became an instant hit. With a horse named Silver and a sidekick named Tato, the show became so popular that dozens of cowboy shows followed in its footsteps. Okay, so what all do you have here? First of all, a complete set of all the comics, all the board games from all the TV shows, all the lunch pails and the thermoses. Lunch boxes are definitely cool. I know some would be worth some money. This is actually sort of my pride and joy. These are all the toy guns that were used in the show. And this is the coolest complete set, Bat Masterson. I remember buying this for about $350 about 30 years ago. 
If this guy paid 350 bucks for a Bat Masterson gun 30 years ago, it could be worth a lot more money now. The rest of this stuff, I have no idea what it's worth. So what were you looking to get out of all this stuff? This is worth like, Twenty-five to forty thousand dollars. If somebody had a store and had time to sell it, I would like to sell this whole thing for fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I have someone come in here and take a look at it? Oh, my pleasure. All right. All right. Good deal. Thanks. I'll give you a call. My pleasure. I'm glad next expert's coming in so we can just verify what I have. I'm Johnny, owner of Toy Shack Las Vegas. We specialize in vintage toys and collectibles. Western toys were made for kids to play with and be used. They weren't made to be collected. So very few of these toys made it through the years. So Johnny, man, is old Western toys like this that collectible? Well, a lot of it's a part of history. You know, a lot of these stories, they might be stories on TV, but they're based on true characters that actually lived back then in the West. So have you seen collections like this before? Never a Western collection this big. This is huge. Oh, this is neat. This is a Bat Masterson playset. You almost never see the box, yet alone the vest and everything else that goes with it all complete. You know, it looks like this gun's never been fired. Okay, so how much is something like that worth? These pieces here, you're looking at about $1,000, just right here on the table. Okay. Wow, this is a great collection of lunch boxes. You got a lot of the thermoses here, which is important too. It's a big factor in the price. These are highly, highly collectible, Rick. This Low Ranger piece is really rare. Probably looking at about $600 just for this piece here. Okay. If it was the blue border, you're looking at about 15. So what do you think, Johnny? In today's market right now, this is a cool collection. You have no problem moving it for eighteen dollars to $20,000 in your shop today. So do you think someone would buy this in all one shot or does it have to be broken up? Your best bet is to break it up because the guy that collects the cap guns isn't gonna collect the games and the guy that collects the comics isn't gonna collect the lunch bells. Thanks, Johnny, I appreciate it. No problem, Rick. I definitely want this collection, but it's gonna be a pain in the butt selling this stuff. It's gonna take time to sort, catalog, and sell this stuff. And time is money. Okay, so how much are you looking to get out of all this? Well, I would like to get 15,000 of these. I'll give you seven grand. Oh, I don't think so. Okay, how about 10, five? And I can't believe I'm going that low. I will go 9,500, not a penny more. You know, if you had one item that was worth 15,000, I can see paying 12 or 13, but this is a lot of work to sell this all individually. This is hundreds of hours of an employee. employee this is true, yeah. Okay, can I keep one comic book? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> 9,500. All, right. all right, it's a deal. All right. I wanted at least 15, but I settled for 9.5. And one way I don't feel good about it, because I know this collection is worth three times as much, but it's time to move on. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. What is this? I have Keith Herring artwork. OK, cool. Where in the hell did you get these? I got them from a friend who got them from Keith Herring's Lover's Lover. From Keith Herring's Lover's Lover. Yes. What a tangled web we weave. <laughs> I helped out a friend, and he gave me this artwork. I thought it was a little cartoonish and childish, but as soon as I did some research on it, I started to appreciate it, and I hope to walk out of here with a big pile of money. If they're real, it's mega cool. It really is. Keith Herring, he started off as a, a graffiti artist, uh, actually went to art school, ended up actually opening a store in New York, and he sold posters and other things. I mean, he sort of created this weird little genre, and when you look at it, you think of a herring. Yes. I love how he did it, though, just some markers. And... Yeah, he drew on everything, chairs, driftwood, anything. I mean, it's really simplistic stuff. Yes. I mean, it's one of those things. I don't know if I like it or if I don't like it. I guess that makes it hard. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's, it's definitely interesting. These might not look like much, but Keith Haring's art really did make a big social impact in the 1980s. I mean, the guy is an icon. I love it when I have a recognizable artist like Haring in my shop. If they're originals, they're worth a lot of money. Yes. And do you want to sell them? I want to sell them. And how much do you want for them? Uh, 75000 Let me have someone check these out, and if he says they're legit, we'll do something. Looking forward to it. I'll be right back, man. 
I'm really excited to have somebody look at it. I think that it's rare, and I hope they're worth a lot of money. These are the herrings you were telling me about. Um, alleged herrings. Alleged, alleged <laughs> herrings, OK. These are great. The thing about Keith Herring, you see a Keith Herring, you know it's a Keith Herring. <laughs> it wouldn't be a stretch to call him the, the world's first fine art cartoonist. <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of his thing. As a matter of fact, you see the outline on the pieces? He did that intentionally to make it seem like the viewer was looking at a television screen, you know, watching a cartoon. Uh, got started as a tagger. Actually did a lot of these same characters in the New York subway system. That's kind of how he got his start. OK. And he took a lot of pride in coming up with these really simple but yet really iconic and identifiable figures and i see a lot of them in here you see you've got the radiant baby he was very well known for the baby the the three-eyed smiley face that was uh, another big thing the snake so very unique okay so do you think they're real that is a real concern so let me see if i can identify anything that tips me off one way or the other it's definitely not a print. You can see the inks. You can see where they're laid on and would be applied with a, a tip. So it's definitely a one of a kind. Now, I'm looking at the signature, and it looks pretty good. He almost always put the K in there, K period herring, and the cross is actually left over from his tagging days. Okay. So that's kind of an identifying symbol there. And he would comment on consumerism. You've got the dollar bill there. He would comment on religion. He always incorporated a cross into his work. So I don't think they're forgeries. I think they're legitimate herring originals. Me too. OK, so what do you think they're worth? You know, pop art is doing really well right now. All right. Andy Warhol is just through the roof, and herring is certainly in that group. I could see them in a gallery in New York in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range. Each. Each. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Hey, pleasure as always. Thank Chip, you very much. It was much. nice meeting you. You've got some nice pieces here. <sighs> okay. So I'll give you forty five grand for. It. Um I can probably find them wholesale for thirty grand a piece. I would say that 50,000 and they're yours. That's an easy $10,000 in your pocket. I'll go 48 grand. That's what I'll go. You want 48,000, I will give you 48,000. That's not a penny more. I have a store to run. 49,000? No. Find someone else to pay you that much money cash. You won't find it here in this town. All right, deal. Okay, All right, I'll meet you right up front, and um, we'll do some paperwork. All right. Only in America can you bring a couple cartoon figures in to a pawn shop and walk out with $48,000. That's a brand new truck. I've got a very rare and historic uh, gold coin you're going to want. Oh, wow. 1809, five dollar gold piece. There's only 25 of them in the world. When and where did you get the coin? Well, I've been collecting coins since I was 10 years old. OK, Back so you got this new from the Met. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I'm not that old, but this is a very rare coin because it's 200 years old. It's worth at least $31,500. For those people who think that coin collecting is for dorks, obviously they haven't made any money collecting coins. This was the equivalent of a week's wages at a good job, say like a master carpenter, or a silversmith, something like that. This is probably the most talked about coin of that era because it's got the weird nine. If you look at it, you can see the number eight that they changed to a nine when they re-engraved the die. Most people believe it was an 1808 die and We'll just hammer a nine on there. <laughs> Try to save some money. Um, but it was the early part of the country. We had to figure it all out. So the first 15, 20 years of the US Mint, it just really wasn't operated well. That's what makes this coin so valuable. It's one of the first coins the United States Mint. So obviously, you want to sell this. Right. Quanto? Uh, <laughs> about $31,510. Um, Luckily, it's already graded. 
It's MS-63, which means mint state 63. Uh, right. It's still in mint state. It's not circulated. And all I got to do is go figure out a price. That should take me four or five minutes. Let me make a few phone calls, do a little research on the internet. Be right back. OK. I know I've done my research, and I'm pricing the coin competitively. It's time to start a college savings plan for my kids, so I hope he uh, understands how valuable and rare this coin is. What's the news? Good news? Bad news? Um, it's listed on different sites as less. It sold for 45000 just a couple years yeah, ago. No, 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 no. More than a couple years ago during the boom. Remember those days? It's not those days. There's no doubt that this is a rare US coin that's worth a lot of money. But coins are just like stocks. They go up and down in value. So if this guy's going to sell me this coin, he's got to realize it's worth a little less nowadays. I will go 25,000 cash. I'll take a check for 27.5 and not a dime less. <sighs> you really going to walk on 2,000? I'll go 26 grand and I, I, I just, I will not go up anymore. I'll split the difference at 27 or... 26 is it. I mean, I hate to destroy a deal over a thousand bucks, but at 26, there's no money left for me. Got to have 27. I'll take a check, no cash. <sighs> okay. Thanks for coming right. in my store. Sorry. Thank Change you. your mind. Come on back. We'll do. I totally respect it when someone sticks to their guns, but I just hate it when a great piece like this walks out the door. I love the coin. But the fact is, I'm a business and I have to make money. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Pretty good, what do we got here? We got a 2020 Alabama Crimson Tide Championship ring set. Whoa, roll tide. Roll tide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here at the pot shop today to try to sell my 2020 Alabama College Football Championship ring set. The set includes three rings, the National Championship ring, the SEC Championship ring, as well as the school ring. My uncle gifted me the ring set. I'm a college football fan, but I'm looking to sell them because they're just kind of sitting on a shelf and collecting dust, so. If I make the sale today, uh, I plan to take my uncle to the national championship game. All right, pretty cool. Yeah, 2020, it's the best year they ever had. Didn't they go undefeated that year? They went undefeated, blew out the competition. They had the SEC championship, they beat the Florida Gators, then in the national championship, beat the Ohio Buckeyes, and I'm pretty sure they could have beat some pro teams that year. I mean, they were that good. And they got this set of rings. So I'm assuming one of them is school ring, SEC championship ring, and we got the uh, national championship ring. That's correct. Can I take them out of the box? Sure. All right. Um, well, I have sausage fingers, so they don't fit me <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> so Keelan Robinson, I mean, was he a bench warmer? Uh, he was a running back. All right. Yeah, these are impressive. I mean, they build them now like Super Bowl rings. Yeah. Okay, just ginormous. Um, up until like 2004, I mean, they were getting pretty fancy, mm -hmm. and they were gold, mm -hmm. and they're no longer gold. You know, the NC2A, what they did was basically they came along and said, these kids are getting championship rings, and they're worth a lot of money, and it's the same as compensation. Mm -hmm. So they came up with a rule that college rings are not allowed to be worth a lot of money. I think the national championship ring can't cost more than 415 bucks. So how much you want for? Uh, I would like 53,000. I did my research and I think that's a fair price. Okay, you did do your research and know that these are not actually Super Bowl rigs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in college football in Alabama, I mean, that's, that's as big right. as it gets. 35,000. Can't, I can't do it for that. How about 42.5? <sighs> I'll give you 40 grand, not a penny more. Um, I think I can make money at that. For, I mean, 40 grand is more than a fair price. I do believe 40,000 is a, a fair price, and you know what? I'll do the deal. Okay, 40 grand, we got a deal? Got a deal. All right, I'll meet you right over there, and I'll get you paid. Sounds good. Thanks. Let's face it, I'm not exactly an athlete. The only way I'm ever gonna get a ring is if I buy it. <laughs> what do you got here, the world's slowest Shelby? This one doesn't move, so I would assume that it is slow. I bet it's pretty fast when you're watching NASCAR. <laughs> I love the damn thing. I just got to get rid of it. Why the hell are you getting rid of it if you love it so much? I got a new baby coming and no room for it. Trading the car couch for a crib. That's what I have to do right now. 
time I got this car couch through an old employer of mine. Did a lot of work for him, and this was the way he could repay me. Hopefully today I can get the amount of money that he owed me for it back. So what can you tell me about this thing? If you plug it into the wall, the lights come on. Uh, real chrome bumpers. It's got a big, big cup holder. You could stick a big 40 ounce in that thing. It's cool, man. What more could you ask for? Um, a lot more. What more could I ask for? <laughs> Do you know who made it or? Corbin Motorsports. They made the whole thing? The, the whole the fenders, thing. fenders, everything? The whole thing. I think it's actually cut off the rear end of a Shelby itself. No, it's definitely not. I mean, it looks like one, but uh, the way you can tell it's not real is, I mean, just look right here. It's molded. It's all one big, giant piece. If it was off a of Shelby Cobra. This would just be cut off right there. Well, that sucks. I thought it would be real. Sorry. The body alone on a real Shelby Cobra can be worth $30,000. No one in their right mind would cut it in half and make a couch out of it. Get up there and sit on it, chum. Can't make an offer on it until I find out if it's comfortable or not. Get your ass up there. Pretty comfy. You're, you're bigger than the couch. <laughs> Where's my 40? It's an interesting collectible for the right person. I can see it going in a guy's game room, but it's definitely not functional for your average living room. I gotta get this thing for the right price, or there's no money to be made. You wanna pawn it, you wanna sell it? I wanna sell it. How much you want for it? Hopefully, I can get the amount that my old boss actually owed me from it. How much he owed you? He owed me 3,500. No, you're not gonna get that. 300 bucks. Three? 300 bucks. Ah, I can't do three. Can we go up any higher than that? The retail is 46. I couldn't come near that. I'm really thinking I could maybe get 600 bucks out of it. I'll go 400 bucks. I won't go a penny more. Yeah. I, uh, really, really limited market. The most I can give you is 400 bucks. I can't do it for four. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. $400, I was expecting a whole lot more than that. Now I'm thinking my boss should uh, give me some more cash than what he actually gave me. What do we have here? I've got the seat of power. <laughs> OK. It belongs to Senator McCarran. Or at least it used to. He hasn't been around for a while. I mean, if this was McCarran's chair, it's got a lot of history to it. You got a squeaky chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming down to the pawn shop today to sell my US senator's chair. Senator McCarran said it in the Senate. This chair is probably worth $7,000. I wouldn't take anything less than $3,500. A Senate seat is literally a seat on the Senate floor. When you get elected to be a senator, they issue you a chair. So where did you get this thing? I've got friends and ex-employees that worked in the Washington, D.C. area. One of them was uh, attending an estate sale and purchased this chair. And they decided I needed this as a retirement gift. Do you know how much your friend paid for it? No, I don't. All I know is that it just will not fit in my house. Senator McCarran was a very powerful guy in the Senate. He was the first native born Nevadan to be elected a senator of Nevada. He served during the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean conflict. This was Senator Pat McCarran's chair. He sat in this chair when we declared war on Japan, Germany, Italy. That's a neat piece of history. Senator Pat McCarran was a big deal in US politics. He served for over two decades in some of the toughest times in American history. And if this was the chair he sat in for all those years, that is unbelievable. It looks like a senator's chair, and it says his name on the back of it. The hardwoods that are used, it's got the casters on it. It's the right leather. It's the right design. It is really cool to think that McCarran could have sat in this chair for 20 years. It has an aura about it. Do you mind if I sit on it? Uh, please do. I do feel like a better person in it. Don't break it. <laughs> to have a senator's chair from an important senator in Vegas, that's a no-brainer. The problem is I've never heard of one coming up for sale. I wouldn't think that family members would let this thing go, but if this is the real deal, I'm buying it. If this is Senator McCarran's chair, I really want it. He was a huge power, and he was great for Nevada. If you've ever flown into Las Vegas, you fly into McCarran International Airport. I want someone to look at it, and I have someone who would know everything about this. I don't know if there's organizations that make replicas of them. And I just want to make sure it's the one that sat on the Senate floor. So let me get him down here. He'll check it out, and 
we'll go from there. Please do. I think an expert looking at this chair could do nothing but add value to it. It came from an authentic source, I believe, and I'm fairly sure it's real. Hey there, Rick. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Doing well. Hey, Mark, what's going Rich? on? I'm Mark. I'm the administrator of the Clark County Museum System. What have we got here? Apparently a senator's chair. Senator McCarran's chair? Oh, now that's interesting. In the U.S. Senate, we have specific desks. Those never leave the Senate. And in fact, people actually sign their desk, sign the drawer in the desk. The chairs, on the other hand, they have to buy it. But you can take the chair home. So how did you acquire this? I have employees that worked in the D.C. area that bought this from Eva Adams' estate sale. And uh, they presented it to me for retirement. That's really nice. You know who Eva Adams was? No. Eva Adams was Patrick McCarran's office manager in the U.S. Senate, and in 1961 was appointed to be the first female director of the U.S. Mint. Patrick McCarran himself is, is a very interesting character, somewhat controversial as well. There was a book a couple of years ago that said that he was the power behind Joe McCarthy and really did believe that we had, you know, communist infiltration Patrick McCarran served 22 years in the U.S. Senate. He was instrumental in creating the Civil Aeronautics Authority, helping to create the U.S. Air Force as a separate military. He was also a rabid anti-communist. This is the style that's used in the U.S. Senate. The fact that it's on casters, it has the wheels on the bottom of the, the legs, that's all correct. It has the right age on it, the right patina on it. Given what it looks like, given the design and all of it, I think you've got the real thing. This was Patrick McCarran's chair. I just wish you'd come to the museum first, because this would be a wonderful piece in the collection. Don't hate on me. <laughs> I, I, I won't hate you. I do I think understand. The price just went up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Rick. Thanks for thank coming you for by, letting me hey, come thanks, in and see it. I gotta have this chair, and I don't even care about selling it. It will get people in the door because it's a big piece of our state's history. So I'll do what I can to make sure it stays here in Vegas. So what do you want to do with it? Pawn it? Sell it? Uh, sell it. You never see one of these come on the market, so what's it worth is really difficult. How about $2,000? It's not a representative's chair. It's not a councilman's chair. It's a senator's chair. How about 5000 I will go three grand, and that is like, that is it. Um, 3,500. I'll go 3,100 and not a penny more. Okay. All right, let's go do some paperwork. Boy, am I glad he went for 3,100. I was really starting to get nervous. It's an awesome buy for us, and I can't wait to get it on display. I have a 1962 American League All-Star team signed baseball. Hey, Rick, who's on first? I'm not going to play that. OK. <laughs> play ball! I love baseball. I grew up with it. I watched a lot of games with my dad growing up. I collect a lot of baseball stuff. I really like the rare, one-of-a-kind items. I'd like to sell the ball because my wife and I are going out of town for our 10th anniversary. I'd like to get about 2000 for the ball, but I'd settle for around 800 So where did you get this? I bought it from the lady whose husband got originally signed at the game. Back then, they played two games. I think this was signed in Chicago. So you don't have any paperwork on it? I don't have any paperwork like on it. I collected for a long time, so I'm pretty confident. All right. Do you mind if I take it out? Sure, go ahead. Uh, it's like a damn Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Here, you do it. Oh, OK. All right. You got to be smarter than the case, son. I know. Um, we have. I am not wearing my glasses. You want me to read it to you? No. You're not wearing your glasses either. I don't need them. Yes, you do. You're supposed to wear your glasses. You're supposed to take your old crazy medicine every morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's just American League signed it? Yep. No National American. League? Yep. No Hank Aaron signed or nope. anything like that? No. All right. OK, we have Yogi Berra and Mickey Mantle. You have Roger Maris on the underside here. This is the year after he broke the home run record. He's a two-time AL MVP. This is the entire roster? All 30, yeah. That's really cool, because being an all-star team, they're only together right. one day a year. That's a really rare, weird thing. So what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. How much you want for it? Well, I know the Maris single-sign balls go for about 2000 so I figure 
right around there would be a good price range to start at. <sighs> the problem is, it's so hard to price things when there's only one of them. Do you mind if I have someone come in and take a look at it? No, I'd be glad to have it checked out. Thanks. I'm a little worried about the expert. If this ball turns out to be fake, I'm going to be upset I got taken by a little old lady in Kansas. Looks like you found a baseball. 1962 All-Star Game, American League. Very nice, man. The All-Star Game gives fans a great chance to see the best of the AL face off against the best of the National League. Here, specifically in 1962, these are some amazing games. Over the years, the All-Star Games changed tremendously. Back in 62, they actually had two different games a month apart from one another. These days, we have the Home Run Derby attached to it, and also the winner of the All-Star Game decides home field advantage for the World Series. Well, do your magic. All right, man, let's see who we have on this ball. On the bottom, Hall of Famer, Tiger's great Al Kaline. And right above him, another Tiger slugger, Rocky Calavito. And then we go over here to the sweet spot. We have Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle. And on the reverse side, it's a little tough to make out, but we have Roger Maris. If this baseball has all real autographs, man, you're talking a couple thousand bucks here. Wow. But the one big concern with balls from this era are clubhouse signatures. Clubhouse signature is basically your nice term for forgery? It, <laughs> yes, uh, yes and no. My definition of forgery is it's an attempt to actually fool somebody. With clubhouse signatures, when you have a multi-signed item, they're not meant to fool somebody. They're just not the actual person who signed it. OK. Are the clubhouse signatures or are they legit? All right, man, got a little bit of news for you. And K-Line and uh, Aparicio, 100% good. But right here on the sweet spot, Yogi Berra and Mickey Mantle, both clubhouse. Very popular Yankees players, both in the Hall of Fame, signed a lot of autographs over the years. I have never seen an autograph of either of them look like that. Now, the main one is Roger Maris. Of all the guys on this baseball, he's the one name you want to see. What you want to look at is the R and Roger and the M and Maris. Now, the R and Roger forms an oval up top, it slants to the right. The M and Maris, it starts off as high as the R, snakes down, and then he brings it right back up about halfway. Okay. Good news for you? This Maris is 100% authentic. Great. Bad news, he could not have picked a worse spot to sign it because of the stamping behind it. You're looking at about 600, 800 bucks. OK. Thanks, man. Hey, you got it. Appreciate it. So what do you want for it? He says it's worth 600 to 800 bucks, so how about 650? 650 is not going to happen. The problem is I sell the thing, and I say these two signatures right here, Mickey Mantle and Yogi Berra, two of the coolest signatures on there, they're not exactly real. I'll give you 400 bucks for it. In my opinion, as a collector, I think the Maris makes the ball. but. How about 550? Um, I'll tell you what, I'll go 450. I won't go a penny more. All right, what the heck? 450 is fine. All right, we'll do some paperwork. Okay, thanks. It may have some clubhouse signatures on it, but $450 for a baseball signed by some of the biggest legends of the game, this is a pretty good score. I'm down at Murray's Theater. This is where he does his magic show. He called me down because one of the people he works with has something he wants to sell me. So I'm down here to see whatever this item is. We know we're in the right spot. It says Murray right there. And Chum wants to learn magic. Does it make you feel like a star? Makes me feel like a groupie. We're going backstage. Murray! Hey, buddy. Hey, there you are. Good seeing you. Welcome backstage. Hey, Chum. What's up? This is Eric, my showroom manager. Hey, how are you? You run the showroom? Eric has a super cool item he thought you guys might like. Where's it at? I got it right here. There we go. What is this thing? This is actually a magician automaton doing a cups and balls routine. Cups and balls is actually one of the oldest magic tricks in the world. So what was the point of this thing? An automaton is basically the first robot of our time. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the day a robot can take over Trump's job. A robot can never do my job, Rick. Robots are efficient. There's logic there somewhere. <laughs> I have this really cool automaton that's pretty old, I think, and it looks magical. And I figured I'd bring it down to Murray, since he knows everything about magic, and I know he's friends with the guys at the pawn shop. It's just been collecting dust, and I thought it might be worth some money. 
I'm gonna let you guys discuss this. I gotta grab a couple things before we open the doors. All right, don't all right. Be, uh, thanks, Mark. Don't yeah. be pulling no magic without me. I'll try not to. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Where'd you get this thing? My grandfather brought it back from Europe after World War II, and it sat in an attic in my grandmother's house forever and ever. So how does this thing work? It's clockwork. It's got a wind-up mechanism. There's rods and gears in there, and it's also got a little music box in there. In Europe, it was really popular all the way back to the 1600s and 1700s to have watches with automations on them where you know, little figures would do stuff on the face of the clock. This is the same thing. So does it work? I've actually never turned it on because I was afraid to break it. Can we try it up? Yeah, it's pretty simple how they worked. You wind it up like a music box. Wow. Oh, that is cool. It's Swift Sides. That's deeply cool. Wait, you recognize that song? Here Comes the Bride? Yeah, you've heard that a few times, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it works really good, but it looks pretty dirty. Like, you know, it's... Kind of like breaking apart. It's real well, dusty. It's... I'm assuming it's right around 1900, and that's the original silk. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, in the manufacturing process of silk to make it really, really shiny, they used mercury. Hmm. But over the years, this happens to the silk. It starts breaking down because of the oh, mercury. Yeah. It's all deteriorating. Uh, so it's really, really cool. I've never seen this particular one before. So what do you want for it? Uh, I think around two grand would be a pretty fair price. OK. I have no idea how much this is worth. Let's get Murray back in here. Yeah. And you'd probably know a little bit more about it than me. Yeah, for sure. Murray! Did you turn this on yet? Have you guys had a look? Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Have you ever seen this particular one? No, but automatons were luxury items. They're not kids' toys. These are in estates and really high-end, rich kind of homes. Way back in the 17th, 18th century, 19th century, the real serious works of art. So we have to take this apart and see the inside here. If you look at the back, and this is really interesting, on this little dial it says Ruge. And Ruge is Charles Ruge. He was one of the pioneers that invented music boxes in St. Croix, Switzerland, around 1865. So that's super cool. If we turn this on now, guys, you'll see the actual comb start playing. In the legs of the doll, you'll see the wires in here going up and down. So this is what triggers the hands and then triggers the actual table. It looks like it does three or four different motions. Because, you know, with these, the more motions they do, the more they're worth. The cool thing about this is it's all original. OK. How much do you think this is worth? This, because of its originality, it works really well. And it's in really great shape. I would value this at $5,500. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's a lot more than I thought it was going to be worth. Well, there you go. Sorry, Rick. You, you guys want to talk about the price and you want to see the magic trick? I'll show you something like this, but in real time. Yeah. You know I got stage fright. Well, this should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so would you take three grand for it? I think that's way too low. Considering what Murray said, would you do 48? No. I mean, I own a business. There's a million one expenses. I'll give you 3,300 bucks. Would you go up to four? No. I'll give you 3,500 bucks and not a penny more. You know what? It's been sitting in my grandmother's attic. I'll do 35. Sweet. All right, awesome. Now I'm going to go find Chum. All right, good luck. Thanks. Hopefully, Murray made him disappear permanently. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? I thought I'd introduce you to my little friend here. I like to call him Little Lindy. OK. This is actually a 1928 Charles Lindbergh aviation doll. Why is he wearing lipstick? I came to the pawn shop today to try and sell my 1928 Charles Lindbergh aviation doll. People might think it's a little weird to love dolls. I don't. It's a wonderful hobby for a grown man to have. Where did you get this thing? You know, I've actually uh, had it for quite a while. It's been in my family. Do you know anything about it? It's Charles Lindbergh. This was done the year after he does the transatlantic flight. It's called an Our Lindy doll. Yeah, Charles Lindbergh became a household name after he flew solo across the Atlantic Ocean. It's 1927. They couldn't make really big planes that were fuel efficient to get him across the ocean. The plane he flew, the gas tank was so big and towards the front of the plane, he had to fly it with a periscope. It was dangerous. He must have been a real badass. You're absolutely right. In 1919, a New York City hotel owner offered a 25 grand reward for the first pilot who could fly nonstop from New York to Paris. Many died trying and it went unclaimed until 1927 
when Charles Lindbergh made his famous flight. Charles Lindbergh was a rock star back then. Within that first month that he got back, he was offered $5 million worth of promotional deals. In today's money, that's like $65 million. All right, I mean, it's definitely cool. It's in great shape. I mean, you still even have the goggles. It was well cared for. You know, if it wasn't for my wife and my daughter, I'd probably still have it and display in my house. As it turns out, my wife hates it, and I tried to put it in my daughter's room, and she screamed. <laughs> okay. Doll collectors will be all over this, but since it's Lindbergh, it opens it up to a lot more potential markets. From aviation collectors to straight up history buffs. What price are you looking for? Let's say 1200 <laughs> No, I'll give you 400 bucks. <laughs> I mean, I've seen smaller Lindy dolls yeah, from the uh, same time period. They go for like 100, 150 bucks. Just because it's a little bit bigger doesn't mean it's worth that much more. Would you go 900 I mean, look at this face. How can you not love this face? I'll tell you what, 500 bucks, I'm not gonna go a penny more. That's what I could go. No, how, how can you sell your best friend for 500 bucks? I would take less than that for Chumley right here. <laughs> <laughs> 500 bucks is what I will go. What do you think, fella? <sighs> All right, All we'll right. do it. That's a deal. All right, Chum, go right about it. Let me try it over there. You know, it seemed like he would not budge from $500. Uh, and to tell you the truth, if I walked back in that door with that doll, um, my wife would put me out. So I really had no choice. Johnny! Hey, what's up, Rick? Check this out. Oh, wow. I was really surprised to see Rick today. He brought me in an interesting piece that I haven't seen in a really long time. I had a guy come in and sell this to me. I don't know a lot about it, but I thought it was really cool. I took a shot on it. You were out of town, so um, I just winged it. Cool, man, cool. Well, I know Lindbergh was the rock star of the day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's probably no guy bigger than him. I mean, as far as just world presence and just what he did for the United States and just made the world smaller by one flight. I mean, it's amazing. In the late 20s, Charles Lindbergh was huge. I mean, this was at a time where dolls started to model big icons of the period. You could see with exact detail, I mean, it's Charles Lindbergh. I mean, the face, you look at the waves in the hair. They've captured everything from the dimples on his face. It's an exact likeness of Charles Lindbergh. They took pride in this piece when they made it. So do you think it's the real deal? Yeah, definitely. This is probably late 20s, probably a year after the flight. You got the leather feet. You got the leather helmet. You got even the little goggles. I mean, this stuff's always lost, you know? And then when it's supposed to the elements, too, sometimes these have stains on the clothes a lot of times. It's here, the suit looks in great shape. Everything looks intact for the period. The condition, and this is phenomenal. For a 1928 piece, I mean, this is as good as you get. Let me ask you, how much did you pay for this piece? I paid 500 bucks for it. Really? You did pretty good. Okay. I would put a retail value of 16, 18 hundred in this piece. Really think I can get 1600 bucks out of it? That's what I'll put on it in my store. I know what you give me for it. So you're saying if I was gonna buy this, I would pay. I love doing business with Johnny. I get his expert opinion, and maybe I'll get a little bit of his cash too. <laughs> I'd give you seven. I bet you'd pay a thousand. I don't know if I give you a thousand. I definitely give you eight hundred. All right, sounds like a deal. All right, cool. All right, all the work is done now. <laughs> Rick kind of threw me for surprise and offering me the piece, but I'm very happy you did. I mean, it's a nice piece. I'd love to have it in the store, and definitely, I know a lot of guys that would love to put this into their collection.